Good evening and welcome to uh, the keynote address for the 1980 Institute on National Affairs. And as always, we're sponsored by the government and student body and would like to uh, thank them, especially this year, for putting up with a uh, few extra of our demands. Um, before tonight's address, I'd like to say a few words about uh, this year's institute. Um, but first, maybe a, a personal word. I'd like to uh, um, recognize someone who uh, recently has been released from the hospital who kind of keeps this thing going from year to year. And uh, Professor Lowry, we wish you the, the best of health and uh, keep it. This year we've kind of undertaken a, an ambitious week. We started off last night with an exceptional performance by Mark Russell. Uh, and tomorrow there will be a noon movie in the Pioneer Room, bringing up Baby with Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn. And then at three, in the, also in the Pioneer Room, Leonard Feinberg will speak <coughs> on, why, why, on why people laugh. And then at eight o'clock, Arthur Berger will top off the night with He Who Laughs Laughs, Humor, Psychic, and Society. And you can kind of count on the entire week for interesting people and talking and topics uh, concerning American humor. Um, we have a number of our brochures, and I'm sure that those of you who heard yesterday picked one up, but uh, if you, you know, want to keep abreast of what's going on this week, I encourage you to pick it up uh, instead of you know, going through it in detail now. As I mentioned, it, it, isn't, it is an ambitious week, but I think also it's going to be a very fun, very interesting week. Uh, We've kind of taken a, a light topic this year, and I think we'll have a lot of fun with it. Tonight, our guest speaker is Brom Weather, uh, who is a professor of American literature at the University of California, Davis. Some of his works include an anthology of American humor and sense and sensibility in the 20th, 20th century. Uh, I think you'll uh, find Professor Weather a very uh, interesting person and, and amusing, as I have in the few hours that I've spent with him today. Uh, tonight he will address us on the great American sense of humor. So would you please give Professor Weber a welcome. Disillusionment will follow almost immediately. <laughs> After such high praise, one can only go downhill. I will say it's good to be at Iowa State because uh, there are people here whom I, whose work on American humor I've respected uh, Leonard Feinberg and Norris Yates. And uh, I don't mean American humor, but satire, world humor, world literature. And I've never had a chance to uh, meet them in the flesh, as it were. They're having a better chance to meet me in the flesh, or worse chance. I'm putting up a worse example than they in their books. But at the very least, they hide behind the books, and I'm here responsible for all I'm going to say, and uh, chargeable directly with the errors I'll commit. Well, my title is The Great American Sense of Humor, which of course is inevitable. But I have had several months to ponder why I'm here tonight. And I think uh, what, I, what I wrote is uh, entirely appropriate after hearing that uh, Mark Russell is a hard act to follow. But uh, I will say that he has derailed me, and if anyone is uh, guilty of uh, incoherence and chaos, it's Russell. I'm, I'm merely, I'm in his shadow, as it were. Well, anyway, I've had several months to ponder why I'm here tonight. Perhaps some of you, like me, may think it's about as funny as hell or the inside of our Iranian embassy to follow a conscious comic artist like Mark Russell and expose myself. Expose, expose myself as one of those unconsciously comic academic flashers who cavort in classrooms for the amusement of students, administrators, and parents, attempting to make tangible such an evanescent entity as the great American sense of humor. Oh yes, occasionally we teachers do make the big time. After all, the late great clown Zero Mostel taught something somewhere before achieving comic fame. Woody Allen was a teaching assistant in the Department of Advanced Sophomoric Wisdom before his expulsion from the City College of New York. I could name others among the great funnies to strengthen my argument. That is, that there is a future for people like me. 
Gilda Radner, Philip Roth, Mel Brooks, Milton Berle, W.C. Fields, Lyndon Johnson, Red Fox, and others. <laughs> These are all great teachers who have gone on to larger things. But the weight of the evidence relating to me clearly suggests that it may have been a mistake to accept your invitation to appear in the ISU sunroom deep in the heart of January. It's true that uh, I have a feeling that Mark Russell or somebody else already has used that gag or should, should have used it. Worse yet, it doesn't even apply to today because today, this Iowa sunshine came through quite attractively. So the weather has played me false as so many other things tend to do. Why then am I here, ready, willing, and able to play the fool, only occasionally the wise fool, fearing that most of you will laugh at me praying in vain that a few will laugh with me. The answer is profoundly simple, as all large truths usually are. Long had I been flooded with an aching inner burden of unfulfilled national mission, when the national affairs voice from Ames reached out for me in Davis with a telephone. <laughs> At once, after 30 seconds of narcissistic contemplation, I hastily agreed to come. For too many years had I been neglecting my missionary duty to explain the great American sense of humor, seduced into hedonistic selfishness by the golden kumquats, all year swimming pools, and lush pot fields of California. I had walked barefoot at my ease in the perfumed cow barns of the University of California, <laughs> taught a course in subsistence farming to future corporations future corporation executives from San Diego and San Francisco who wanted a smell of the clean, fresh earth. Annually had I planted three profitable field crops, sugar beet, safflower, and tomatoes in the fertile topsoil of my suburban estate, nurtured a dog and a cat on 100% organic edibles. But why go on? I came to my senses and Iowa, inspired by the telephone call, and that marvelous ascetic, that veritable saint, self-denying Jerry Brown, who had shaken groupies, zanies, and songbirds from his fur, and hastened forth to deliver a message of insatiable ambition and guaranteed futility to the nation at large. Resolutely, despite drawing wages as governor of our great state, he had abandoned the state capital for an arena equally worthy of statesmanlike neglect and Zen Buddhism. Incidentally, it was rumored last week that Brown had not been seen more than three times in Sacramento since last September, not even during the gay protest march last week, and that was a highly important event for all of us in Northern California. I might add that I sat across the aisle from Brown last summer in a PSA plane headed for downtown Burbank, and my eyes filled with tears immediately. This sweet model of visionary renunciation kept staring at me accusingly night after night on the TV screen. So I likewise have gathered up my spirit and thought, grown steely-eyed, hoarse, intense, and fretful. No longer am I content to go down footnoted in the history of shame as the superhedonist of UC Davis. I have ventured into Iowa, may even move on to International Falls, Minnesota. <laughs> Un undaunted like Jerry, by snow, hail, snickers, and low pole ratings. The pregnant message I bring may be summed up in the famous words which energized a sagging national temper. When they appeared in the 1960s in Thomas Pynchon's novel V, and now can be found on millions of virtually, well, on, on virtually millions of t-shirts in these our American states. Keep laughing, but care, or don't care, as you see fit. This translates into the following. Down with the malaise that gripped the White House, soon after resident narcotics expert Dr. Peter Bourne, mentioned yesterday with much affection, was driven from the White House premises and was no longer around to dispense pet pills to a hardworking administration. This was the malaise the administration soon thereafter detected in the American people as a whole. The founding father Thomas Jefferson were alive, in good health and in this audience, a reticent smile of quiet pride in the American people would be fluttering across his thin lips. Mistakenly assumed to have been a humorless genius, Jefferson in reality was a repressed comic. 
True, he lacked the extroverted bounce and stage presence of his egotistical contemporary, Benjamin Franklin. That quick change artist, brazenly masqueraded like a coonskin hillbilly in ultra chic Parisian salons, and told dirty jokes in Pennsylvania Dutch dialect during hilarious sessions of the Continental Congress. I suppose he must give Franklin his due. However, we also must never forget that it was Je Jefferson's Declaration of Independence which legally established the unalienable, self-evident right of Americans to spend their lives in the pursuit of humor. The Declaration, furthermore, begot the Articles of Confederation, and they begot the Constitution, which in turn begot the Bill of Rights, and so forth. And I could go on to speak of other significant documents. We own the American sense of humor for perpetuity or until the Russians cancel our property rights. With characteristic wit, Jefferson slyly wrote the phrase pursuit of happiness into the Declaration instead of the phrase pursuit of humor. This was an exceptionally astute linguistic substitution when one considers the political realities of the 1770s. All around him, impeding the progress of the revolution, were caterwauling senior academics, busy deconstructing and destroying literature, thought, social order, psychology, and child development, confusing themselves and others with theoretical disputes about the phenomenological distinctions between colonial humor and Renaissance humors, <laughs> between comedy and humor, British taxes and American smugglers, comedy and tragedy, high humor and low humor, George III, and William Shakespeare, word, play, and nonsense. Creeping about to further complicate political issues and problems were hordes of junior academics, browbeating each other with existential questions, such as was a parody parodying a burlesque, structurally a burlesque parody, or a parody burlesque? <laughs> was a cosmic joke metaphysically the same as a practical joke? Could there logically be a comedy of situation without characters as opposed to a comedy of characters unengaged in situations? These are crucial questions that remain unanswered <laughs> and which we should explore. But Jefferson, being a pragmatic man of action, recognized that it was unwise to postpone the revolution while he composed the essential handbook of definitions necessary to quiet down the intellectually disoriented who had been trained at great 18th century centers of learning such as Yale, Harvard, and Princeton. Happiness, that's the word he shouted during a moment of epiphany. Everyone knows that happiness means being in a good humor and linguistic precision be damned. For Jefferson trusted the people and knew what they knew. He had brilliantly intuited four self-evident truths engrossed in the hearts and minds of the people since the 1620s. One, every American possesses a sense of humor, which is an unalienable right. Two, every American sense of humor is equal and an unalienable right. Three, <clears throat> differences between senses of humor are an, are an unalienable right. Four, an unalienable right to an individual sense of humor carries with it a corollary unalienable right to find humor in and apply humor to all areas encompassed by the two other unalienable rights, namely life and liberty. These are crucial, this is crucial doctrine, and we all are grateful to him. His wisdom is unquestionable. There's little that we can say to criticize him, even in his frivolity, shifting from humor to happiness. For example, I never make a quick, I never make a move these days without first sneaking a look at a New Yorker cartoon I always carry tucked into my wallet. And here it is. I, I treasure this more than my Visa card, believe me. <laughs> the cartoon caption has provided me with a title for my comments here tonight. If I'd been enterprising and go-getting, you would have had a, an enormous blow-up of this cartoon behind me. But uh, as it was pointed out, it was well that I didn't do it because then I would have lost your attention completely. <laughs> so it's just as well. I'll, I'll show it to you and you must trust me. The cartoon caption, as I say, provided me with the title for my comments here tonight. If you look closely from wherever you are, you'll see three miserable characters 
sipping overpriced knockout drops while a cynical bartender wipes and rewipes the countertop. Suddenly, one of the barflies, conceivably a reincarnation of the Blessed Jefferson, impulsively reminds his downhearted pals of the rich cultural heritage they've overlooked. Quote, if it weren't for the great American sense of humor, this country would really be in a mess, period. There's nothing more that need be said. It clears everything up and eases some of the stress a few of us may have been undergoing in the past few weeks. I was very moved by this and fell into biblical, or what shall I say, fell into bad biblical rhythm. So spake he, like one who might have been the oracle of ancient Delphi, before whom troubled Greeks bustled about, offering gifts and chattering about their troubles, demanding laughter prescriptions. It took a simple, unassuming man of the people, the kind Jefferson trusted, like our barfly, someone who could green up the wilted self-evident truths with Jefferson permanently planted in the American democratic soil. It took such a man to remind us that we neglect fertilization and irrigation of our sense of humor at our peril, social, national, and whatnot. Has not the great American sense of humor during the past two centuries made life endurable for all of us? Despite ever increasing crime, war, science, irrationality, rationality, sex, neighbors, frozen food, technology, narcotics, education, multinational corporations, children, friends, computers, education, war, politics, pets, marriage, immigration, inflation, unalienable, self evident rights, liberation, credit cards and the countless other insoluble problems which keep rolling out of the ample cornucopia of American history. Who else but an American, for example, would be able to develop a humorous view of the present excruciating mess in Iran? Here is the proof. I should say no one. I left that out. No one but an American could do so. Here is the proof, generously presented to me in advance of publication by one of the most eminent psychosociologists in the country. He's on the West Coast, but I'll say no more. X has insisted that his identity be kept secret, a request I gratefully honor. <laughs> Generously funded by foundations, corporations, government agencies, and anyone who wanted to give money, X had undertaken to study the impact of political terrorism and kidnapping in Iran on the sensibilities of Americans from every segment of the population, every sexual, ethnic, social, economic, religious, physical, occupational, and psychological sex segment of the general population. All human subjects participating in excess clinical experiments wisely were given lifelong disability pensions in advance to encourage them to participate. Three representative groups were required to watch television news reports broadcast daily by CBS, ABC, and NBC. The fourth group set up for control purposes was permitted to watch only such shows as the $1.98 Beauty Show, Real People, The Rockford Files, Saturday Night Live, Soap, The Gong Show, Make Me Laugh, and Taxi, and other similar shows. The experiments were conducted in a luxurious Los Angeles hotel rented exclusively for the period of the study. Contestants were free to wear clothing of their choice. Seven hours of sleep were mandatory, and the uniform diet was tasty and cosmopolitan. Sexual adventuring, even between husbands and wives, was encouraged <laughs> during morning, afternoon, and evening snack and exercise breaks. Strategically located videotape cameras, some of them embedded in the brain and other body parts of each participant, <laughs> recorded the individual's act, acts, statements, thoughts, emotions, dreams, and physical condition. This was a very thorough experiment, almost comparable to the trips to the moon. <laughs> clinical, observa uh, clinical observations made during the experiment are so voluminous that no one, not even X, has yet been able to read them all. In fact, as X ad admitted, the results were predictable, so why waste time reading a lot of nonsense <laughs> when fresh, similarly path-breaking experiments were already funded and waiting to be started. What X predicted, in other words, he discovered. Specifically, 
The control group initially was wide awake and laughed on cue whenever, the pro whenever programs with laugh tracks scientifically engineered by Northridge Electronics in Southern California were screened. Programs without canned laughter elicited a smaller volume of laughter. About halfway through the experiment, X related, control group members continued to laugh but failed to watch the TV screens. <laughs> Seemingly more entertained by encounter group gropings in the darkened rooms than by the comedy shows. At the three-quarter mark, almost all in the control group appeared exhausted and slept fitfully. Some of them laughed continuously, even in their sleep, particularly when the, sound, when the decibel level of the soundtracks was increased to deafening proportions. <clears throat> the three groups watching the news programs gave vent to more promising laughter. As day three of America hostage in Iran gave way to day four, then, in, then to day 34, day 43, day 72, and so on, group members initially became increasingly irritable and restless. Some complained of headaches. Others foreswore the consumption of Iranian foods. A few shrieked expletives and demanded military intervention. There were seven promising guffaws when President Carter issued an ultimatum that, unless the hostages were released on Christmas Day, he would ban export to Iran of all Baskin Robbins and Howard Johnson ice cream varieties except chocolate and vanilla. <laughs> the generally morose disposition of the three groups was alleviated interestingly on Christmas Day. One of the hostages, a Jewish businessman from Southern California, humorously insisted on addressing his rabbi, each of the three Christian clergymen who had come to the embassy to offer solace and piano solos to the hostages. Finally, on day 439, when President Carter sternly promised to ban worldwide export of American athletes and McDonald's hamburgers, this is a sacred day, by the way, I neglected to say, to lovers of American humor, the day when he issued this stern decision. To repeat, he sternly promised to ban worldwide export of American athletes and McDonald's hamburgers unless the Russians by May 1st evacuated Afghanistan, Iran, Yugoslavia, Pakistan, India, the OPEC countries, and California. <laughs> a general riot broke forth on that day, a riot of hysterical laughter, <clears throat> which seemed to have captured all the experimental subjects and could not be quelled, despite everything the laboratory technicians did. X worked hard, no success. A hastily assembled team of holistic Beverly Hills mental therapists reported that the American sense of humor had reasserted itself democratically without coercion. The nation was saved. One Hollywood comic writer who had volunteered to be a participant in the experiment quickly drafted a special TV show in which the Ayatollah Khomeini was shown to be a low-grade sit-down comic far inferior to Buster Keaton, Stan Laurel, and Don Rickles. TV newsmen deliberately pronounced the Iranian foreign minister's name in 12 different ways. <laughs> Laughter. Our sense of humor at last was saving us. X quickly halted his clinical experiment, though he had not expended all available funding. It was a selfless gesture. A giggling delegation of experimental subjects met with X during the last day's afternoon snack break. The group spokesperson laughingly declared that President Carter's anecdote about a predatory rabbit had been misunderstood. This is the result of the, you know, being concerned with humor. This, this anecdote about a predatory rabbit had been misunderstood because we had lost our sense of humor, because we had forgotten our comic heritage. Jimmy was, in fact, a homespun folk comic, deeply rooted in the southwestern tradition of American humor. He had brilliantly adapted the 19th century humor classic of T.B. Thorpe, entitled The Big Bear of Arkansas. He had adapted it to 20th century realities, but we were unaware of all of this. Like Thorpe and other great Americans gifted with a creative comic imagination, Jimmy had ludicrously exaggerated the size, ferocity, and powers of a humble rabbit 
in order the more easily to cut them down to size with a swiftly parried oar blade. The sword essentially was a symbol of American strength and adversity. The oar, the sword-like oar, I should say. Because oh, this moves me deeply, and I tend to misread, particularly when I write illegibly. <laughs> the sword-like oar was a symbol of American strength and adversity. The rabbit encounter, a metaphor for America's inevitable triumph over the catatonic deadpan antics of an Iranian comedian who could only use one hand in a kind of come hither, goodbye gesture. You've all seen it. It's hard to tell whether he wants you to approach or to go, but whatever it is, it's loving. Furthermore, but suddenly the spokesman burst into a gasp of incoherent laughter, and so did the delegation, and so did X, and so did the lab technicians, and so did the psychiatrists, and so did all those to whom the true meaning of the rabbit anecdote was later explained. The laughter continues, but it has, be it has become so common that we don't often hear it. The nation is so quiet that we may, we may even wonder if anyone is laughing about the messes we're in. And that, of course, is what touches me deeply and reminds me of the cartoon. <clears throat> For my part, I am doing my best as a teacher of the young to reinvigorate those in whom the sense of humor may have become dormant or never existed. I will either plant it or nurture it. The description of the course in American humor I teach at the University of California makes that perfectly clear. I quote verbatim from a description I recently wrote so that students could determine in advance whether or not to enroll in the course. Quote, this course has been designed for one, those who are exuberant in spirit and enjoy amusement uninhibitedly and unashamedly, as well as for two, those who would like to emerge from closeted misery and mingle guiltlessly with persons in category one. <laughs> Healers increasingly prescribe humor therapy for many common ailments in place of old-fashioned remedies such as medication, meditation, hot tubbing in the nude, surgery, and jogging. However, humor therapy in this course is cheaper, more effective, much more comprehensive, pleasurable, and lasting than when administered in home, clinic, or office by state-approved or state-disapproved medical or mental therapists. Course requirements are few and easily met. Enrollment, capacity to read American English, reading humorous American literature, several non-taxing examinations. And that's the end of the description. There is one obvious limitation in the course design. It's dependence upon literature, which I do my best to overcome. But I can't work miracles in 10 short weeks. Can I? Can any one of you? However, I try to make amends by emphasizing that students who complete the course successfully have only arrived at the beginning of their recovery. They must proceed on their own to explore humor in an interdisciplinary fashion, making themselves fully aware of the extent to which the great American sense of humor reveals itself in every phase, past and present, of human experience, culture, and society. Here are some insights and suggestions from the mixed bag of prescriptions for self-therapy and humor, which I offer gratis to those students who have earned at least a C. I present them to you in helter-skelter fashion in order to de-emphasize my own pet theories, because ordinarily one puts one's favorite thoughts first and to prevent the growth of an unhealthy professional attitude to humor. All holistic statements that I'm going to present overlap one another. And you will note that the ones which follow strive for the essential redundancy, piquancy, and uniqueness, which makes both life and humor so amusing. <clears throat> Do not be misled by anyone, including yourself into believing that there are some things too serious or too sacred to be laughed at by Americans. From time immemorial, mankind has laughed without apprehension about everything eternal or temporal. Buddha smiles, deeply religious Puritans in 17th century New England, felt it a religious obligation to be overjoyed before, during, and after the deaths of loved ones to whom God had extended grace and privileged places in heaven. 
the late Lenny Bruce imagined that he was the reincarnation of the Old Testament's funny old Job, and the essential similarities between them are more numerous than the differences. If American culture has tabooed <clears throat> excuse me, certain subjects out of the realm of humor, other cultures have stamped them fit for laughter. Join the less repressive culture, at least in the privacy of your own home, and then discover outside of it that there are hundreds or millions who are laughing with you. Become a professional comic, earn a good living, have a nervous breakdown, and get patched up by a humor therapist. Write Sid Caesar, Jonathan Winters, Mel Brooks, and others for pertinent details. Do not be misled by anyone who tells you why, how, and at what you ought to be laughing. If you don't enjoy watching the slaughter of human beings or the humiliation of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, you have the unalienable right not to laugh. Advocates of total liberation insist upon the purifying aspects of vomitic experience. But you may not find it either comic or comfortable to vomit up your tonsils and intestinal tract. I was speaking there of vomitic humor in contrast to conventional comedic comedy or humor. And there is, of course, a category of vomitic humor, which some of you have run across. It's not my invention. It's, it's, a, it's, a, play, it's a borrowing. I claim no scholarly first on the matter. Despite the insistence of humor quacks, those who grind out chopped humor for television, newspapers, nightclubs, college campuses, and psychoneurotic patients, Laughter will not cure baldness, poverty, politics, inflation, impotence, flatulence, or incipient cancer. Nothing else may work either, either for that matter. But that fact is the kind of cosmic joke which a generous god of his yet undetermined ethnic background and sexual gender has created for us to laugh at every now and then when we have time. Avoid international congresses of humor at which sociologists, anthropologists, sexologists, neurologists, psychiatrists, communication arts specialists, literary critics, American studies professors, people like myself, agents handling bookings for nightclub comics, and all those who are deep into humor. Don't attend congresses at which people like these read learned or non-learned papers or applaud those who read these papers. Always bear in mind Ralph Waldo Emerson's admonition to be self-reliant. Particularly be aware that our post-industrial professionals have ruined every area of humor, human activity in which they have specialized. I cite medicine as a classic example. Perhaps humor follows close thereafter and should not be allowed to extract the life juices from our American humor. I understand this. In similar spirit, avoid reading books and articles on humor, laughter, comedy, and their mixed offspring. Exceptions must be made. For example, the talks being given during this week's National Affairs Symposium on American humor are unusually valuable and should be listened to extremely <laughs> carefully. Don't be an elitist in the field of humor. Drop down on all fours and snuffle for humor in every nook, cranny, and avenue of the world around you. Discover William Hedgepath's The Hog Book and the Doonesbury comic strips. Immerse yourself in Saturday morning TV cartoon programs for children. Learn to be nostalgic about those which contain unforgettable characters, such as a moose and Russian spies named Boris and Natasha. Fall laughing out of your chair every time Wiley Coyotes batter to death. Nor should you ignore political cartoons in which our leaders are presented as stupid knuckleheads exactly like those who preceded them and who ruled the British colonies and those who have ruled thereafter. Be eclectic at all costs and avoid the, call and avoid the curse of novelty. <clears throat> Punk rock, for example, seems to have faded. It only seems to. There is much good fun still to be had from watching its death throes. <laughs> for example, Jello Biafra, a distinguished punk rocker from San Francisco, is one artist who is trying to keep punk rock alive by any means. Any means he can. 
Let me read a description of Biafra's pungent humor from the San Francisco Chronicle of October, 12th, 9, October 25th, 1979. He ran for mayor of San Francisco, and it's a sad day, or I should say San Francisco will never get over their, or San Franciscans will never cease regretting their failure to elect him. I wish I could blow up the photograph of the, the, the woman he's with. <clears throat> you know about Jello Biafra, of course. Jello Biafra, candidate for mayor of San Francisco, is not much into the niceties of subtlety or good taste. He is, after all, lead singer of a punk rock band called the Dead Kennedys. He's more into being outrageous and that makes him the most colorful in this year's crop of minor candidates for mayor. Those with so much drive, idealism, or hunger for publicity that they are inspired to enter the race without a prayer of winning. It is a venture that costs each of the candidates for mayor a filing fee of $1,254.20, unless they're able to substitute voter petitions at a rate of four signatures for every dollar of the filing fee plus whatever they spend on signs, billboards, leaflets, and buttons. But Biafra insists it's worth the cost and effort. He denies he's just in it for the publicity and says there is a political angle to the dead Kennedys and their effort to outrage. He's a profound humorist, in other words. Misunderstood, like most of us. The name is not meant so much as an attack on the Kennedys, but on the anti-political me generation that followed their assassinations Biafra argues. We're an anti-apathy band. Biafra, who dresses in classic Goodwill suits, says he does not live up to what he calls the Time Magazine stereotype of punk rockers who dye their hair orange and put safety pins through their noses. But Biafra, whose satirical songs include Kill the Poor and Dreadlock of the Suburbs, does have a tendency to fall off stage during his performances, <laughs> at which point Punk fans routinely attempt to undress him. Usually they get my shirt off, he said. Last time they also got my pants off. If they keep doing that, I'm going to stop jumping into the audience. <laughs> Biafra's mayoral platform calls for election of police officers every four years, a board of bribery to set systematic standards for civic corruption. Condemnation of Pier 39 so that citizens could enjoy tearing it down and erection of Dan White statues, Dan White being the supervisor who dispensed hastily with two city employees, the erection of Dan White statues so that the city could sell eggs, stones, and tomatoes to throw at the statues. There are many selfless comic geniuses, such as Biafra, in communities throughout the United States. They deserve our unselfish support. But I don't want to be dragged off this platform before demonstrating that I can be seriously serious about the American sense of humor. Thus far, I've been kidding around, making light of it all in myself, and you too, I suppose. Though I shrink back from specialism, fate has made me earn my bread as a professor of American literature. In my judgment, <clears throat> which I supported with positive evidence in my anthology of American humor published in 1962, the most aesthetically complex writers in American literary history, the highbrow writers such as Edward Taylor, Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Herman Melville, Henry James, Emily Dickinson, I could keep going for weeks, Edith Wharton, F. Scott Fitzgerald, to cite but a few, none of whom were regarded as deliberately conscious humorists, in my judgment, had all mixed comedy and tragedy in their greatest works of prose and poetry. What I propounded at that time is now an accepted critical commonplace. In fact, if one examines, if one has the energy and strength to examine titles of dissertations written during the past oh, 17 or so, 15 years, the grimness of Walt Whitman and Walt Whitman as a comic buffoon and so on, all kinds of titles that are staggering in the, in the 1960s would have resulted in a dismissal from graduate school. How about the highbrow writers of the past 20 years? Uh, 
I think I've skipped a page, which I value dearly. <laughs> There's something about known as self-retribution, and this may be an instance of it. It's impossible for me to, well, I'll extemporize, <laughs> except that it's out of order. Well, I'll pick it up at the end. <laughs> How about the highbrow writers of the past 20 years? Have they continued the tradition of American humor, affirmative and derogatory, subtle and broad, which their predecessors established? I think they have, but I do not think the results are equally good. Could Vonnegut's Jailbird, which current bestseller, which I'm sure many, some of you have read, I regret my, the fact that I did, is indubitably a comic novel. However, whereas Hawthorne and Melville grappled with large themes in complex stylistic and intellectual manner, Vonnegut's prose unrolls as blandly as toothpaste, sounding more like Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers, and Horatio Alger than that of someone trying to reach post-adolescent readers. Of course, we're told, we can be told that he's deliberately trying to be innocent. Well, what about his innocence? Self-indulgent, childishly egotistical, convinced that his cataract-ridden view of the American world is as piercingly insightful as a sensitive adult or a sensitive child, eager to pose as an innocent lad confined in a decaying body. This is meant to be a metaphor of the American condition in our times. Vonnegut panders the most limited kind of humor necessary to appeal to a popular taste, generated and kept from developing by the popular culture technologists of the post-World War II period. <clears throat> At this moment, the pen ceased, my mind and time running dry. I have just finished reading, and I will come back to uh, the matter of experience. I just don't understand why I left out my experience at the University of Minnesota, particularly when it's so close to, uh, to Ames. Well, I'll, I'll reminisce later. I just finished reading uh, Philip, uh, well, I, I just finished reading Philip Roth's The Ghost Rider, and it seemed to me to be uh, not only not a comic novel, but not even a successful one. And I also uh, have been reading uh, <coughs> Joseph Heller's Good as Gold. And that's a novel that's on many of you have read. It's not a bestseller. Looking at the bestseller list in the Des Moines Register this afternoon, I noticed that Jailbird was a bestseller, but Good as Gold had already vanished from the top ten or whatever it is, uh, whatever is the number of books that get on that bestseller list. Uh, Good as Gold uh, is an interesting book. It's very funny. The It certainly uh, resurrects uh, much of the enormous comic literary talent that fascinated many people and continues to fascinate many people now when they read Catch-22, book published in the early 1960s. And it makes as much, I mean, it makes as much mincemeat or hash or trash out of the government, out of our elected and self-appointed authorities as uh, Catch-22 made of the military establishment. But it's a very interesting uh, book in, 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 in the fact that it's so fashionably <clears throat> pessimistic, whereas uh, Catch-22 was not. I remember when I first read Catch-22, I thought it was a book that ended weakly without guts. Because what was the conclusion? Uh, the hero, the comic hero, sails forth into the distance and presumably is going, there's a chance that he'll manage to escape from the network of confusion, chaos, deliberate, unconscious that surrounds his world from all the lies, mishaps, uh, confusion. The kind of thing, for example, that uh, we keep reading about in the papers uh, all the time. Just the other day, I had the pleasure, and some of you did too, of reading about uh, the government's uh, handling of uh, the removal of the Shah, 
Uh, that was almost like Catch-22. Uh, and it's almost like good as gold. But interestingly enough, instead of focusing upon uh, the government, as he did in the, as he focused upon the army in Catch-22, Heller introduces the fashionable note of ethnicity. It's now become very fashionable to look in the mirror, and if you're an Italian, to call yourself Dago, and if you're a Jew, to call yourself Kike. This means expressing yourself fully. It's expressive therapy, and it does a great deal for the guts. And so the, the hero, Bruce Gold, uh, is a Jew who exposes himself, uh, when, oh, who exposes himself whenever he's not uh, making fun of himself to those who will make fun of him cruelly and otherwise. The book then is a mockery, it, it seems to be split in purpose. On the one hand, it makes fun of those who would delve into ethnic experience, something I think uh, should not be made, uh, should not be ridiculed because it's so important, even for an understanding of American humor, and I'll say something about that briefly. But it's also important if you're going to deal with the government uh, and with the double talk that goes on, and there's some splendidly witty dialogue uh, that Heller has created, you don't uh, somehow split the novel down the middle, nor do you become, nor I should say, nor do you like a fashionable writer, such as, for example, Portnoy. Portnoy's complaint showed Roth to be, Philip Roth to be, nor do you intrude into the novel. There is a kind of breakdown of aesthetic morale and a breakdown of social morale in go in Heller's good as gold. <clears throat> I don't know if any of you disagree with me. I hope you do, so that we can discuss the matter. But the, the matter of ethnicity is part of the interdisciplinary approach to humor. It was very conventional <clears throat> uh, when uh, <clears throat> American humor first began to be taken seriously <clears throat> for someone like Constance Rourke, an early pioneer, other people like Bernard DeVoto, Walter Blair, still alive, others, myself, some of you, to think about American literature wholly in a kind of isolated or limited cultural tradition. Thought about folk humor, Northeast, Middle Atlantic, Yankee, Down East, South, Southeastern, Southwestern, and so on. Paid no attention to the humor of the Pennsylvania Germans. We paid no attention to the humor of uh, the immigrants who lived in uh, Boston or those Swedes who lived in Delaware, who may have spoken English, as I did, but still were humor. No attention to the Dutch. We paid no attention in the 19th century to Irish humor. We paid no attention to Italian or Greek humor immediately after the turn of the 20th century. If we paid any, if, if scholars paid any attention to it, it was to somehow regard all these forms of humor, their dialects and so on, their substance matter, as being non-native, not part of Native American humor. <clears throat> in getting a true picture of American humor, in understanding the American sense of humor, as I said, there is no single sense of humor. There is no single sense of humor within a single ethnic group. There are numerous, numerous senses of humor. Everything depends upon the experience of the ethnic group or the individual member of an ethnic group. What I laugh at, you may not laugh at. I've shown a lot of bad taste here, I hope. And I, hope so, and I think some of you may not have liked it. I apologize for it, and I give you an opportunity to show your own bad taste. <laughs> and then perhaps, however, you might convert me. I don't know. That's possible. What I did want to say was that at one time I was much more serious about American humor than I am now. I was really, I think, moving forward in a very wholesome academic fashion. I am being academically funny now, too. I know it's, it's conventional and to be expected. But I was, I was really much more academic than I am now. And I remember I offered a course. I don't know where this page is because I wrote it quite beautifully. <laughs> I remember I offered the first course in, Ameri in American humor to be given at the University of Minnesota in, in the Department of English. Now, you know, if you know the University of Minnesota Department of English in the late 1950s and early 1960s, it was really a distinctive group. Uh, I remember we used to meet once a week, 
uh, recounting the names of those who had once taught there and had gone on to other places, and this was part of our distinction. <laughs> we then looked around at each other and uh, prayed that some of us would be leaving soon to give additional <laughs> distinction to the department. Well, when I decided to offer a course in, the, in American literary humor, uh, there was a lot of dismay. It, it was a uh, it was a questionable matter, and I remember there were meetings and meetings about the whole issue. And uh, one of my colleagues, an, an August, a very distinguished scholar who had written a book on the sublime, said that he felt it his duty to explore this nest of slime that I was beginning to smear over the English department. And so we came down to listen to one of my class sessions. Well, at that time, as I say, I was much more academic, much more serious, and knew much more than I do now. So the session was, it was really an exceptionally profound one, richly philosophical, metaphysical, and so on. He reported with enormous enthusiasm to the chairman of the English department and the department as a whole while I sat on quite happy, contented. He said that I was, this, this course was not a joke course. I wasn't trying to amuse the students, nor was I giving them any sense that they had to laugh. Everyone was serious throughout the program, particularly me. I referred to Kant, to Plato, to Aristotle, to Bergson. I referred to all theorists of humor. I referred to psychologists. I brought Freud and his jokes in. Never once did my face increase into the slightest smile. I was a responsible individual who had not really disgraced the English department, and it would be possible to go on to offer this course without fear that we would be exposed on campus as irresponsible, and perhaps even having students who were laughing. I, I, I for example, he said, and he looked with commendation toward me, had not uttered one joke no student, to repeat, had smiled. The material had been accepted with the gravity it merited. This was literary study, not gagging, not one-lining, not comedy. And of course, he was the man, it just turns out, who at every cocktail party, even in the slightest state of tipsiness, would at once burst into obscene limericks. Couldn't be controlled. <laughs> had to be hustled out into an anteroom until he could calm down. But that was okay at a cocktail party, but not within a classroom, not within a university. <clears throat> you may wonder if I've finished. In fact, I have. But and I finished before, five minutes earlier than I thought I would, unlike Mark Russell, it was decent enough to go on for 15 minutes beyond his contractual period. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll answer questions for five, I'll, I'll defend myself first. <laughs> answer questions as well for more, for five minutes more than I had intended to.